I don't know if you heard, but Texas football has been in a bit of a rut this past decade. Well, going on 12 years now. And I am kindly reminded in the comments section daily by rival fans. So since it's the off season, I figured it's time for a little introspection. Let's take a look at Texas's lack of success and discover what's really going on. Before the show, make sure to check out the homies over at Inside Texas for your Longhorn fix. Those guys continue to do a great job on covering the portal, 23 recruits, and what's going on inside the program. You won't regret it. Subscribe over at InsideTexas.com today. Now, there's a lot of hot takes about why Texas has been down, but it's more complex than a single source. So let's make sense of it all and more importantly, discover how to get out of this mess. Without further ado, let's get into it. First, let's look at the most common response from non-Texas fans, boosters. And it's easy to see why this concept took hold amongst the wider college football fans. Number one, it's a simple answer and people don't really have time to dive in. Second, people love a good conspiracy and the concept of shadowy puppet masters orchestrating power struggles behind the scenes makes for good intrigue. But ultimately, I don't believe it holds up as the core issue. Here's why. Let's consider the environment that surrounds the program. Texas is the most academically rigorous public institution in the state, lowest acceptance rate, and third in the nation for endowments behind Harvard and Yale, pulling in $30 billion in 2020. Texas' football program alone is valued at a little over a billion dollars. Undoubtedly, there's a lot of money and high-power individuals hanging around. And to pretend donors are purely altruistic is naive. They're investors, and their returns come in the forms of wins for their favorite team. Say you donated $5 million to the local Red Cross, and they proceeded to light it on fire in front of you. You'd have something to say. So why it is accurate that donors' opinions are amplified compared to the average fan, they don't decide if you're running a four-down front. They don't decide which QB does best in the RPO game. They don't decide to miss field goals with three seconds left on the clock. And then you'll hear things in popular media like, Nick Saban doesn't have to deal with boosters, it's his program. Well, duh. He had 12 wins in year two and he already had a national championship. Nick Saban wins an average of seven games for a year or even a two-year span, and I bet you those silent Alabama boosters get more chatty. They exist at Georgia, Ohio State, Clemson, and Alabama. The difference is those schools win, so you don't hear about them. So my argument is boosters voicing displeasure are a symptom of not winning, not the cause for not winning. And yes, they can put pressure on administrations, but it only makes sense to do so after accumulating losses for a few years. You win 10 games a season consistently, those voices in the room are suddenly quiet. So while the concept of just pointing to this shadow group is tempting, it's mostly fan fiction. Texas has been wealthy for decades, and they were rich and powerful when Mac played in two championship games. Reality is, the majority of Power 5 programs would kill for the financial power Texas generates, and to pretend like having too much money is the problem is odd. But there is some merit in the core argument. Blaming boosters is an aroundabout way of commenting on the big C word. Culture. Culture is this overarching concept comprised of many factors, and culture doesn't exist on its own as a tangible item. Culture is an abstraction, and it's only implemented through human beings and the decisions that they undertake. So what's in the water? What affects culture? Well, there's the broader culture of the university as a whole. And UT can promote an elitist mindset that can permeate any major due to the selective nature of the school. This pat yourself on the back culture can be self-sabotaging, and that's why the wine and cheese slash country club crowd knock has been around when describing Texas for decades. So is that a valid criticism? That the university inflates the ego prematurely? And I'd say yes. I spent my time over at UT in the film school, a top program nationwide. The first day of class, the professor looked at the room of 200 of us and he said, you got in. Take a second and give yourself a round of applause. But our applause was silenced the moment it began. That's enough because the real work starts now. The professor knew it's easy to think you've arrived just due to your admission and made it clear from day one being on campus isn't what makes you special. It's what you do with the resources at the program that does. And then we can look at another wider culture, and that's the city of Austin. And it's easy to get caught up in the coolness. There's distractions around every corner if you go looking, a place where trouble and success can be found in equal measure. But if the city of Austin or the university was the sole reason, then Texas would suffer in all other sports, and that's not the case. Baseball, volleyball, track and field, golf, and tennis all have championships post-2010. So what is it about the football team specifically that causes these issues? Culture is built through consistency, and Texas hasn't had that in some years. And it starts with coaching. It's been inconsistent. And Max started to lose his spark towards the end of his tenure. And Texas is a high-pressure gig, and that fire appeared to fade. 
On top of that, he shifted his recruiting focus to place a premium on quote-unquote high-character guys, opposed to the wild bunch during the Vince days. And it was a dedicated team that brought in the wins, but headaches behind the scenes came with it. He still recruited at a top level, but the team lost that confident, borderline cocky edge that made us formidable during the Vince years. And then you land Charlie Strong, a good dude that was just over his head managing a billion-dollar enterprise and living in the shadow of Mac's success. He had three years and only won 16 games, losing 21, the worst winning percentage in Texas football history. Strong's recruiting paled in comparison to Max, ranging from 7th nationally all the way to 25th. And he did have some good coaches in his ranks, but it wasn't enough to stack up wins. And it's very hard to generate buy-in without results, especially not improving into year 2 and year 3. Then coaches hit the panic button and start cycling through coordinators, limiting schematic stability. Then you had Tom Herman's style, which was more authoritarian behind the scenes. His leadership style could be described as abrasive with both donors and players. That fear-based style caused players to turn inward and just focus on not stepping out of line, opposed to reaching out and forging bonds, the bonds you need to lean on when you're down with the game on the line. There's been three head coaches since Max, so there's instability. But it's more about the revolving door of coordinators and assistants. We're on our fifth offensive coordinator in eight years, with five defensive coordinators in that same time frame. Each coach brings their own vision to their side of the ball, altering schemes and forcing players to learn new rules and even switch positions. And once they could get comfortable understanding the overarching strategy, then a change would occur. Switching from smash mouth run focus to spread to power spread to now Sark's pro style deep shot RPO offense didn't grant players time to grow in their abilities. On defense, we switched from four down to three down to four down fronts, single high to two high in coverage. These philosophical changes lead to different body types being prioritized and thus change the types of players you recruit. By the time you recruited for one scheme, another coach would show up and not have the player types required for his new scheme. With coordinators bouncing around, of course the assistant coaches were even more volatile. Position coaches are the ones that work specifically with the players, doing the bulk of the true on-field development and skill acquisition. Some were straight up unqualified, like Herman's first staff, so they didn't have the ability to build athletes. Others had their coordinator fired and had to find a new school. With all this movement, it's easy to see why the group wasn't cohesive. How could it be? This leads to players going into a scarcity mindset, only able to focus on themselves since there isn't a uniting vision held over time to actually buy into. A group of individuals emerged and lack of team camaraderie followed. When the chips were down, they scattered opposed to banding together. This caused major culture issues because there wasn't even a culture in place. It changed every year. This coaching carousel constantly interrupting recruiting efforts and Texas's recruiting struggled. And yes, I know at first this sounds silly, but people, even Texas fans, assumed Texas had regularly had top five classes since Mac left. Often hearing things like, I just don't get it. Texas has the talent, but can't make it work. And that's not the case. In 2014, Texas class was ranked 17th overall. In 2015, 10th. 2016, 7th. 2017, 25th. Then Herman arrives in 2018, and he lands the third ranked class, and he does the same in 2019 then slipping to 8th in 2020, and finally 15th overall in 2021. So on average, Texas had the 11th overall ranked class spanning from 2014 to 2021. And that's not bad, but it's definitely not the perception of Texas has top 5 classes every year and still doesn't win. Another perception is Texas gets several 5 stars annually and they do nothing with them. Since 2014, Texas has signed 6 5 stars. That's 6 in 8 years. And in that same span, Alabama has signed 35 5 stars. Alabama has signed 6 or more 5 stars in 3 separate seasons than Texas has amassed in total since 2016. Of Texas's six five stars in that time, linebacker Malik Jefferson, safeties Caden Stearns and B.J. Foster, receiver Jordan Whittington, running back Bajan Robinson, and tight end Jatavion Sanders, only three of those remain on the roster. What you'll also notice about the few elite guys, not a single one of them are trench players. In order to be elite and play for championships, you need top offensive and defensive linemen. Without those positions being recruited at top levels, you're just playing seven on seven. Linemen are what create the game of football. Offensive line has particularly struggled. From 2017 to 2021, Texas has recruited 17 offensive linemen. Zero remain from the 2017 class. Two remain from 2018. Zero remain from 2019. 
four remain from 2020, and just two remain from 2021. So of the last five years of recruiting, only eight linemen are still on the team. For comparison, Kansas is second to last in offensive line recruiting for the Big 12, signing 18 players in this time frame. And on top of that, they didn't even sign a single offensive lineman in the 2019 class. With a poor offensive line with no depth, it's tough to maximize the most important position on the field, quarterback. And Texas has struggled at that position as well. The Longhorns have only been great when we had elite tier quarterback play. Starting with Charlie Strong, we were just throwing guys at the wall and seeing what stuck. Gerard Hurd wasn't ready and was forced to play early, and it hurt his development. Then we tried a young Shane Bouchelle who also wasn't ready, and you can't blame him. Finally, Sam Ellinger arrives in 2017 and through pure grit stole the job as a freshman and played the remainder of his career. And he didn't have an elite aspect to his game, but Sam was the leader of the team and no one could deny his toughness. He masked a lot of offensive issues through his preparation, yet it wasn't enough to get over the hump. Texas needs to pull in top quarterbacks you see at the Alabama, Clemson, and Ohio States of the world. We haven't landed a five-star quarterback since Garrett Gilbert in 2009, and that finally changed with the arrival of Quinn, but we have yet to see that play out. On top of recruiting not being as it appears to the wider public, the landscape in recruiting has changed significantly. Since Mack left in 2014, several out-of-state powers have taken their recruiting to another level. Texas used to have the pick of the litter of Texas talent. Now Alabama, Georgia, Clemson, Ohio State, and Oklahoma regularly poach the top Texas talent. In-state, A&M moved to the SEC, providing an option for blue chips that want to play in the SEC. TCU joined the conference, and Gary Patterson picked up Texas players that were needed depth. Baylor went from doormat of the Big 12 to winning several championships and in return pulling some Texas targets into Waco. Texas Tech rode a wave of success after Leach's offensive powerhouse days, and each of the in-state schools did their part in pulling potential Texas starters and a ton of depth-slash-developmental players from the Longhorns. Now let's zoom out and look at the team as a whole to see how roster management has been a crucial issue. The 2018 and 2019 classes are your upperclassmen, the players you rely on to start games and sustain culture. From 2018, seven recruited players remain. Only six remain from 2019. 13 total players to lead the young guys and show them the ropes. Except those 13 don't even know the ropes since they have went through coaching change after coaching change. So while recruiting classes numbers can trick you by seeing a flashy name headline the class, you learn that the top talent on the team are skilled players. And when you dive into the current roster as a whole, it's evident the upperclassmen talent has been absolutely decimated. Not shocking that Texas didn't have a guy drafted because the pool of available players is tiny. And I know that wasn't very fun to hear. Trust me, it wasn't that fun to write, but I hope it illuminates Texas' struggles during the dark decade. The comprehensive view is that Texas has struggled with culture due to the boosters getting antsy after three to four years of bad returns, leading to coaches being let go, screwing up the recruiting of primarily trench players, leading to roster depletion, all the while the recruiting landscape shifted away from Texas's stranglehold. It's a bummer, but now that we can understand the multiple factors, how do you fix it? First, find the right head coach that's personable and can connect with his assistants, players, and donors. Coach is a political position, whether we like it or not, is often the highest paid public figure in the state. That head coach must then hire proven coordinators, known not only for their schematic advantage, but their ability to identify and hire effective position coaches. Those position coaches should have track records in either NFL development or recruiting. And if you can get both of those abilities in a single position coach, then that's icing on the cake. Once you hire a capable staff, then you pull in top talent, but particularly at offensive line, defensive line, and quarterback. Then you retain and develop those players to become starters, who then become all-conference and then mature into the NFL. The mix of developed talent and solid scheme will lead to wins, which leads to attention, which leads to more draft picks, which then entices more top talent to join. It's a beautiful, vicious cycle that Alabama and Georgia have perfected. And though the program has been plagued by some tough issues, it's not all doom and gloom, even after a rough season. I think we have begun to address these core issues. 
Sark is a likable guy that can reach players, fans, and donors alike. Recruiting is back on track, especially in the trenches. We secured a number one ranked quarterback and we're in the hunt for Arch Manning. Offensive scheme is top-notch and proven. We struggled on defense mightily, but PK's previous stops showed his schematic and developmental ability. Several coaches bolster resumes of developing players into the league and coaching in the NFL themselves. And Sark is focused on roster management and talks about the holes in the depth chart and he works to fill them as well as securing some nice portal additions while being aggressive in the ones that didn't go our way. Sark also decided to not fire coordinators after one bad year. We've seen constant coaching changes without a set culture has awful effects on a program. I wanted to do this deep dive so both Texas fans and wider college football fans can understand building and sustaining a program isn't easy, and there's a lot that goes into it, and that simple answers don't suffice. Don't take wins for granted no matter who you are, and enjoy the ride no matter how bumpy it can get. Thanks for hanging out, watch some more of my videos here, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and share if you want to support quality Texas content. As always, welcome.